Okay, so while you're getting signed in, okay, uh, the details of this lab or the purpose of this lab is that we want to investigate uh, what chemical changes look like, okay? Uh, what are the signs of a chemical change? Okay, how do we know when it so has occurred? What happens when a chemical change occurs? So to do that, we're going to be doing a lab with um, a bunch of different chemical reactions. So I'll have some prescribed pairs of materials that you will mix in the lab and you will observe what happens when they are mixed and you'll record the signs you see. Okay, so as a quick review here, what are some of the signs of a chemical reaction? Bubbles. Bubbles. Okay, so we can have bubbles uh, which are an indication that what has been produced? A gas. Okay, so if a gas is evolved, that could be bubbles. It could also just be an odor. Sometimes you don't get bubbles. Sometimes you just get an odor. Okay, so that's a sign that something new has been produced. What else? Temperature change. There could be a temperature change. A precipitate. There could be a precipitate being formed. Okay, and usually if we get a precipitate, that would also be uh, in conjunction with a change in color, usually. Okay, usually it goes from two solutions that are clear to having, you know, a precipitate that has some color, even if it's white, okay, or, you know, or yellow or purple or whatever, okay, there's a color change as well, okay, those are all signs of a reaction that we're going to need to be on the lookout for when we mix these different pairs of materials, right? So the problem we're investigating here is, okay, what, is, what evidence do we have that a reaction takes place when substances are mixed? Okay, so we're looking for what are the signs of a chemical change. All right. So for our design and variables here, all right, there's we have remember what we have to do for this. We have to identify our manipulated variable and explain why it's manipulated, how it's being manipulated. Then identify our responding variable and how it's responding, why it's responding. Then how many controlled variables? Okay, three controlled variables, why they're being controlled, how they're being controlled. Okay, that's what we have to explain. Now, I'm going to help you with that a little bit here. Okay, so if you listen carefully, you might get some big juicy hints for, okay, the design part. Now, in this lab, every time we do it, we're mixing two different things together. Okay, so in this lab, we're going to have several different pairs. Okay, we're going to have seven different pairs of chemicals that will be mixed together. Each time that we mix these different pairs together, you know, like we might be manipulating the different combinations of materials. <coughs> Some of you got that. Okay? Every time we manipulate the combination of materials, there should be a responding change in the appearance of the mixture. Subtle, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, we're looking for, in this lab, we're looking for the signs that a chemical change has occurred. Okay, that's what we're looking for. Now, Every time we mix these pairs, okay, we want to make sure that we're getting a fair comparison, right? Running a controlled experiment, right? So we need to think about what kinds of things need to stay the same each time I mix these different combinations, right? Um, some of these can be environmental. Okay, we already talked about in the properties of compounds lab that uh, the temperature of the room can affect certain things about chemical and physical properties, right? So maybe you want to use that as one of your controlled variables. You're welcome. Okay? You need to come up with two more controlled variables, okay? Things, two other things that you need to do the same every time you mix two different materials and watch for the responding change in their appearance. Okay. What three words need to be in our hypothesis? If, if and, and then. All right. Now, in this experiment, okay, we're investigating chemical reactions. So in the if part, my suggestion is this. 
go back to Dalton. Did Dalton tell us what happens in a chemical reaction? It's like point number three, okay, in his atomic theory. Okay, the if part of your hypothesis should tell me what happens in a chemical reaction, not what it looks like. But what Dalton says happens. Find a way to reword what he said happens in a chemical reaction. So it would be, if a chemical reaction is, and tell me what it is. Okay, that's what we're looking for in the if part. If, what is a chemical reaction? Okay, because that's the premise we're working on. Okay, if the chemical reaction is this, okay, the and part is going to describe the experiment very briefly. Essentially, different pairs of materials will be mixed together and the reactions observed. In the then part, okay, you need to tell me two things. Okay? Those two things are how you'll know a chemical reaction occurred okay. and that would be, I would say, talking about the signs of a reaction and what that means has happened. I should say that a different way. Why? Okay. Why do those signs tell you a reaction has occurred? Okay. So in the then part, talk about the signs of a reaction and why they indicate a chemical change has occurred. Okay. So in the if part, you're telling me what a chemical change is. In the then part, you're telling me how you'll know one has occurred. You don't have to write the procedure this time. Okay? I've already made it up for you. All, right? All you'll have to do is follow it. Okay? The procedure is pretty straightforward. Okay? You're going to contain five milliliter samples of each solution or about one gram if it's a solid. Okay? Um, the materials will all be on the front um, table okay? when we get to the lab. Right? So some of them will be solids and they'll have a scoop. Okay? Some of them will be in little Erlenmeyer flasks okay? and they'll have eyedroppers in them. Okay, to use instead. All right, so if um, when you're taking these, okay, if you're taking a liquid, you'll squeeze the, the eyedropper and get as much into the eyedropper as possible. Okay, and then turn the eyedropper upside down and take the eyedropper back to your table. All right, so you'll have kind of one in each hand. Okay, uh, well, actually, no, sorry, you won't have one in each hand. You'll put one of the materials in your watch glass. You're going to be using this. Okay, to do the reactions. If you watch the observations video for the first lab, this is what I did, this is what I used. It looks like a contact lens, but it's about this big. Okay, that's where your reactions are going to occur. So you got <coughs> lots of space, okay, because remember we said one of the sources of error in the first lab was that we didn't have very much of everything. We're going to solve that problem, we're going to have more of everything, and we're going to have a big area to watch it happen in. Okay, so this big thing, you're going to put one of your materials in here and you're going to bring the other one back in an eyedropper okay, to your table. Okay, when you're at your table, that's where you want the reaction to occur so that you can observe it. Okay, everybody follow me on that? Okay. All right, now, when you're doing that, okay, you need to be watching for the signs of a chemical change. That means you're going to need a thermometer because one of the signs of a chemical change is a change in temperature. So you're going to need to have that thermometer in the reaction when you start it. Okay, so put it in the one that's in the watch glass and then push in the other one and observe okay, for any changes in temperature. Okay, and then obviously you're using your other senses other than taste okay, for um, observing the other signs of a chemical change, including smell. One of the reactions has no visible signs. Okay? You probably won't even observe a temperature change. There will be no observable change in the appearance of anything, but it'll get right stinky okay, when it happens. Okay? So you have to be 
ready to observe basically anything. Like it'll curl the hair in the nose. Okay. Okay, um, so you're going to just record those pairs. It, it shouldn't take very long. You're basically just mixing them together. Everything happens right away. Okay, it's not like you have to sit there and watch each reaction for five minutes. Okay, the reactions are immediate. Okay? I've made all of the solutions uber concentrated. Okay, so that everything happens very, very quickly and very, very obviously. Um, Okay, so the next thing we have to do is we need to look at what reactions are we putting together because we actually need to predict what these reactions are going to do. Okay, so you have this chart, okay, in your uh, lab report there, okay, and it's under initiating and planning. Right, so under initiating and planning, okay, what we want to do is um, fill in, oops, is fill in this chart. Okay, so we're gonna identify the reaction types here, okay, and then we're gonna look at predicting. Now this is the first time that we've predicted any chemical reaction, so I'm gonna walk you through each one, okay? All right. So for our first pair here, we're mixing sodium hydroxide, which is an ionic compound, with ammonium chloride. Is that also an ionic compound? Yes, it is. Okay, what kind of a reaction has reactants that are both ionic compounds? Okay, only one reaction type starts up. Double. double replacement. Okay, so this is a double replacement reaction. Okay, so the first step to predicting the products of a reaction is to identify what type of reaction is occurring. From there, we know what happens in that kind of a reaction. Okay, so once we know what kind of reaction is occurring, then we just need to kind of follow the pattern of that reaction. In a double replacement reaction, we know that what happens is the two things that are acting like metals switch partners. Okay, they were kind of follow me on that, right? That's what we said always happens, right? So if sodium is with hydroxide over here, who is sodium going to end up with over here? have to make an ionic compound, which is a metal and a non-metal, that isn't the same as the one that was on the reactant side. So who should sodium end up with? Chlorine. With chlorine. Okay, sodium was with hydroxide. This is the non-metal. Okay, chlorine is the non-metal in that other compound. Okay, so that means that sodium should end up with chlorine. Who should ammonium end up with? What's left? Hydroxide. Hydroxide, yeah. Okay, that's what's left. So basically all I did was swap the metals. Remember, ammonium's the only uh, non or sorry, the only polyatomic ion that's positively charged, so it acts like a metal. Okay? So now I've predicted my products. All I did was swap the partners of the metals. Okay? Now that's my prediction. Does that necessarily mean that that reaction will go that way? It doesn't. Okay? But looking at that reaction, if it goes that way, I may not see any sign of a reaction. Maybe there might be a small temperature change or something, but both of those compounds are soluble in water, so I won't get a precipitate. Okay? Um, I don't know if there would be any visible changes there. Okay? But we'll wait and see. Okay? We'll wait and see. When we do that reaction, maybe something unexpected occurs. All right, I'm going to skip over pair two for now just because it's kind of a strange one, and I want to go to one that's a little more simple, okay? And that's pair three, okay? In pair three, I once again have sodium hydroxide, which is an ionic compound, reacting with magnesium chloride, which is also an ionic compound. So what kind of reaction is occurring here? Another double replacement reaction, okay? In a double replacement reaction, the metals do what? They switch partners. Okay, so sodium was with hydroxide over here, so sodium's gonna end up with? Who on the other side? Chlorine. Okay, it's gotta end up with the other non-metal, which means then that magnesium has to end up with the 
What's left? Hydroxide. All right, now I've just made two ionic compounds. Okay, what do I need to do with them both? Whenever I do, whenever I make an ionic compound, I have to drop and swap. Okay, so sodium's a plus one, chlorine's a minus one, so that compound's fine. Okay, magnesium's a plus two, hydroxide's a minus one. What do I need to do here? Put the brackets around. Put the brackets around hydroxide and put the two outside the brackets. Okay, so now I've done that, okay, uh, now what do I need to do with that reaction? I've got to balance it, yeah, okay, uh, I'm going to start with chlorine, it's a 2, hydroxide's a 2 as well, but I'm going to start with chlorine, okay, there's two chlorines on this side, okay, and I'm going to put 2 over here, oh, you're probably wondering, how do I put the little 2 on? Control, comma, yeah. control, comma, subscripts, and control... Period is. Period goes up. Yeah. Good. You, so control, control comma, okay, uh, will put you into subscript, and that's how you do the little twos. Okay. All right. Um, so I've got two in front of NaCl, but when I do that, it gives me two sodiums. So I've got to go back over here and put a two in front of sodium hydroxide. Okay. Um, I've got two. That gives me two hydroxides, which is great because there's two over here. Okay. There's one magnesium here and one magnesium there. My reaction is balanced. Okay. So really, predicting the products of a reaction is not a whole lot more difficult than just writing a reaction out. As long as we understand what pattern they all follow, okay, it's pretty easy to figure out what will end up on the other side. Okay. Uh, you don't have to predict pair four or pair five. They're not reaction types that we actually cover in Science 10. They're, they're uh, indicator reactions. Okay. But let's have a look at Let's have a look at pair seven. Okay. So for pair seven, I've got zinc, which is a metal, and it's by itself, so it's an element, reacting with hydrogen chloride, which is an ionic compound. Well, what were the two ones that we couldn't do again? Four and five. Okay. okay. So I've got zinc, an element, reacting with hydrogen chloride, Okay, which is an ionic compound. What kind of reaction starts out with an element reacting with an ionic compound? Single replacement. Okay, in a single replacement reaction, the thing that's an element replaces the thing it's like in the ionic compound. Zinc's a metal. What's acting as the metal in hydrogen chloride? Hydrogen. Okay, so that means zinc's going to replace hydrogen. So zinc will end up with chlorine. And what will happen to hydrogen? It will be by itself. Now, top right corner of your periodic table is hydrogen in that list of special elements. It is. Okay? That's one of those things we always have to look for. Okay? And this is an ionic compound, so I need to drop and swap it. So I've got zinc, which is 2 plus, and chlorine, which is a minus 1. products of that reaction. What else do I need to do to this? I gotta balance it. Okay, so I can pick either hydrogen or chlorine. They're both twos, and I'm only gonna have to add one number here. Okay, if I put a two in front of this, does that make them both balance? Alright, I'm gonna give you guys a minute or two. I want you to try predicting the products for pair six. Okay, you have two ionic compounds reacting with each other. Okay, see if you can predict and balance that reaction. I'll give you a couple minutes and we'll walk through it together. Alright, so first off, what kind of reaction is it? You've got ionic compound reacting with ionic compound. It's a double replacement. Okay. Remember, in a double replacement, all that's gonna happen is this. The metals are going to switch places. That's it. That's all that happens in a double replacement reaction. I just move the metals around. Okay. So potassium will end up with nitrate, lead will end up with iodine. That's all that's going to happen. Every double replacement reaction is exactly the same. Just take the metals and switch them. 
Okay? You switch them, you're done. You've predicted the products of a double replacement reaction. Okay? Same with a single replacement reaction. All you do is switch the two things that are alike. Okay? This was a metal, so I switched it with the metal. Done. Okay? That's all there is to predicting uh, replacement reactions. Okay? So on this side then, I'm going to have okay, um, potassium is going to be with nitrate. Okay? This is a plus one and this is a minus one. So that compound is fine the way it's written. Okay? And lead is going to end up with iodine. Okay? Lead's a two plus, iodine's a one minus. So we're looking at PbI2. Right? So all I do is switch the metals. Okay? Switch the metals and I'm done. Right? Now I need to balance the whole reaction. Okay, I'll start with nitrate. There's two nitrates over here. So I'm going to have to put a two in front of this to give me two nitrates. That'll give me two potassium. So I put a two there. That gives me two iodine. There's two iodine on the other side. Okay, the balancing doesn't change. The balancing back as you did for all the other ones. Okay, so if we're looking at these two reactions, Okay, pair seven is producing zinc chloride, which is soluble in water, and it's producing hydrogen, which when it's an element, is a what? Look at, your, look at the periodic table up there. What color is hydrogen? Red. Red things are all gases. Okay, so what should this one probably do? Bubble. Yeah, it should bubble. I should see some bubbles on this one. Okay? So that's kind of the, the process we want to go through when we're predicting a reaction. Okay, sure, I predicted the reaction, like the equation, but what's it going to look like? Okay? In this case, it's probably going to look like um, a clear solution and some bubbling and fizzing. Okay? In fact, with this reaction, okay, um, if you can capture the hydrogen gas, you can set it on fire. Okay? Sometimes uh, if I see a group that's got a particularly good one going, I'll put a, a match over it and the match will pop like crazy. The, the flame just dances and pops all over the place as it burns the hydrogen gas. It, luckily it doesn't produce a lot of it because hydrogen gas is really explosive. You know, that whole Hindenburg thing. Yeah, that big Zeppelin, that big blimp that the Germans had that blew up all over the humanity back then. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, let's have a look at, um, or sorry, at this one here, at pair six, okay? So I've got potassium iodide, which is just a, gonna be a clear solution. Lead to nitrate, also soluble, so that'll be a clear solution, okay? It'll make potassium nitrate, which is soluble, and lead to iodide, which is not soluble. So this reaction should produce a what? what we call a solid that forms in the reaction. A precipitate, okay? We should get a precipitate in that reaction. Okay, those are the kind of things you want to look for. All right, now we're going to look at pair number two here. Pair number two is a little bit tricky because we've got um, an ionic compound here that's not written the way we normally write things, okay? This ionic compound is hydrogen acetate. It should actually be written like this. No. It doesn't, it, I mean, according to the ionic rules, that's how we should write it. But because this ion is also organic, we write it the other way, okay? This is vinegar, okay? CH3COOH is acetic acid, hydrogen acetate, okay? It's, well, if you bought it in the store, it would be vinegar. The stuff we have, you would not put it on your fries or it would eat them for you, okay? It's what we call glacial acetic acid. Um, the stuff you buy in the store is 5% acetic acid. The stuff we have in the, in the lab that I use to make this solution is basically 100%. Okay. So yeah, don't eat it. It smells like vinegar, but no. Okay. All right, um, so I've got that one. So that means that hydrogen is acting as the metal and acetate is the non-metal. Okay, just for clarity. Okay, and then we have sodium hydrogen carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, which is more commonly known as. You did this one like we when you were in like the fifth grade. You use baking soda. Okay, this is vinegar and baking soda, except on steroids because it's the super vinegar. Okay, not the not the store bought kind. 
right? Uh, so this is okay, uh, an ionic compound as well. Sodium acting as the metal, hydrogen carbonate acting as the non-metal. So what kind of reaction are we looking at here? Double replacement. Okay, so hydrogen's the metal on this one, sodium's the metal on this one, and in a double replacement reaction, I swap the metals. Okay, so what I'm gonna end up with is this. Sodium is gonna be with acetate. Okay, sodium acetate is a salt. In fact, it is the salt used to flavor salt and vinegar chips. Because it has the acetate on there, it tastes like And then we will have as our other compound, okay, um, hydrogen with hydrogen carbonate. So that'll be, which we could also write like this. Either way would work. Okay, and that reaction is balanced the way it's written. Okay, now, oh, sorry, I'll let you finish that and then we'll talk about it. Okay, um, so with this reaction, okay, I mean, you, like I say, you guys have seen this reaction before, okay, uh, when you were, you know, smaller. Um, what happens in this reaction? Like when you mix vinegar and baking soda, what does it do? <laughs> it bubbles and fizzes, right? What's being produced if it bubbles and fizzes? Yes. Are either of those a gas? Okay, so we've predicted this reaction. Did we necessarily predict it correctly? We didn't. Okay, and that's okay. We're just, it's just a prediction. Okay? We know that when this reaction actually occurs, we get a gas. The gas that's produced is carbon dioxide. Okay? On Monday, after we do the lab, I'll show you how that reaction actually goes. All right. So you've got the remainder of class here, you can work on the rest of the pre-lab stuff. So getting the wording right for your hypothesis, the wording right for all your variables, okay? um, getting the problem written in your own words in the form of a question, okay? give you a bit of time to get that stuff done. Um, obviously, you're also gonna need a chart of some kind for your observations for the lab on Monday. Okay? Um, Okay, uh, so that'll be in there if you want to just do it on your phone in the lab or if you want to print a copy of that, okay, that would also be fine. My suggestion would be that you might want to alter this slightly to have a before and an after. Okay, so you can observe okay, these were both clear solutions before and after there was this. Or one of the things was a white powder, one of the things was a clear solution after there was this. Okay, just so you have that comparison. So that would be a suggestion. You might just want to split that in half and go before and after. Okay. All right, so those are the things you can be working on here for the remainder of class. We'll do that lab on Monday, and then I think I made it do the Friday, right? That's what I did. I made it do the Friday. All right, so we'll have today's class to work on it, Monday's class to work on it a bit after we do the lab, okay, and then um, it'll be on your own after that.